In my mother's first vivid memory, she was three years old, awakened in the middle of the night by loudspeakers ordering everyone to assemble in Cobrins Town Square. She remembers putting on her green coat with epaulets and going to the square with her parents, sister, and her grandmother. They sat on the sidewalk. All around them, dogs barking, people screaming. Germans read lists of names of the elderly, the disabled. They read the name Rivka Kroman. My mother's grandmother was, as my mother puts it, the love of her life at the time. She was kind, generous, always ready to give a hug. My mother remembers the softness and smell of her skin. That night, she was wearing a black crepe dress with multicolored striped dots. My grandmother was hysterical holding onto her mother. Rivka was stoic. She said in a soft voice, I don't want you to cry. I want you to remember, you are going to survive because I am your sacrifice. She walked backward, never turning her back to her family until they put her on a canvas covered truck. My mother, Suzanne Cohn, was born Shalamet Dubietsky in 1938 in Kobrin, then Poland, now part of Belarus. My grandmother, Tanya Kroman, was educated at the gymnasium, loved beautiful things, and skiing. My grandfather, Walter Zevdov Dubietsky, was from a more religious family. With little formal education, he spoke several languages, including a clean Polish. He ran a dairy and pig farm in Borki and later worked in my grandmother's family soap factory. Russia invaded in 1939, confiscating the farm. Two years later, Germany captured Kobrin, burning the synagogue, mandating yellow armbands, and establishing a ghetto where my mother, her sister Rachel, her parents, and grandmother lived together. My grandfather had been trying to find false identity papers. After my great-grandmother was deported, they snuck my mother and her sister out of the ghetto to a farm but soon their host said he could not keep the girls. Then my grandparents hid them for three weeks in a utility shed at their factory, which was outside the ghetto and now controlled by the Germans. Rachel was nine, my mother four. Grunia, the family's housekeeper, came every day with food and water hidden in a bucket under mops and rags. My grandparents, who had Arbeit cards to work at the factory, came when they could. The girls could hear German voices outside the shed's window. My mother got sick, so Rachel gave her her share of the water. My mother climbed up on a crate to ask the Germans for water, but Rachel pulled her down, and my mother hit her head. When their parents next came to check them, Rachel said, We can't stay here anymore. I can't take care of her. She's sick, we're scared. My Auntie Ray said of this time, one day I was a child, the next day I was an old woman. They went back to the ghetto. Three days later, the sirens rang again. They ran to a school on the outskirts of the ghetto and hid with 12 others under the stage of the school's auditorium. They could hear the Germans pulling people out, stomping on the stage. One uncle said, Shalamet is so young, she will make noise. He said to save everyone else, he would have to kill her. My grandmother insisted my mother would not cry, and somehow she didn't. She watched through a slit as family members hiding in a nearby room were discovered and shot. They stayed under the stage for a couple of days, lying down because they couldn't sit up. They had no food, it was dark, damp and very cold. On a rainy night, they escaped. Since the school was at the edge of the ghetto, they had to get through an enormous barbed wire fence. The adults climbed over, but my mother was too small, so with bleeding hands, her father dug under the fence and she crawled out. They all crawled for hours until they reached the utility shed at the factory, and they stayed there for three weeks until they got the final false identity paper for my mother. My grandparents became Joseph and Valentina Kelkevich, their daughters Danusha and Mechislava, 
The newly christened Kalkevich family tra traveled west to Brest. They were introduced to the Leskovich Machievsky family, religious Christians who were known to help Jews. They would live and travel as one family for much of the war. Their new grandparents, aunts, and uncles taught the girls to be Christians. They said daily prayers, wore a cross, and went to church. Soon, my mother couldn't recall that she was Jewish. Because their papers showed they had come from another town, the families were eligible for housing from Pshet's many empty houses. My mother went with her father and Mr. Leskovich to look at a house. While the men talked, my mother found a pile of Jewish books and a white iron bed with a beautiful white quilt. When she lifted the quilt, to her horror, she found a dead baby. My grandfather, who had served in the Polish army, worked in the Polish underground, the AK. He was a supply master. He procured and distributed clothing and weapons, which he hid in his yard. He was constantly making contacts, assessing trustworthiness, negotiating deals to help the underground and to protect his family. In February 1944, my Auntie Wendy was born. My grandmother wasn't able to breastfeed her, so Irka Leszkowicz, who had had a daughter a few months earlier, nursed both babies. Members of my grandfather's AK group started to disappear, so they left Brest and traveled by wagon, train, and foot to Warsaw, Grzeszówka, and Praga. My grandfather was arrested at least three times by Germans, Poles, and Russians. Once, five members of the Gestapo stopped my grandfather and a colleague as, he left, as they left a restaurant. They demanded papers and made the men drop their pants. The soldiers said, you are circumcised. You are Jews. My grandfather said, what will you gain by killing me? You are a human being just like me. I have a family, children. They took my grandfather's watch and ring, but let him go. After each such incident, they would move on. In June of 1944, a Polish police officer took my grandfather's papers, so he found new papers. They became Jan and Maria Ludwitzki. My grandfather found himself responsible for 23 people. He secured train tickets for all 23 by giving the local commandant a donation to the Red Cross. In the fall of 1944, they arrived at Piotrakov, a gathering place for refugees. My grandfather learned that Mr. Leszkowicz had escaped from a train on the way to a concentration camp, and Mrs. Leszkowicz had been ill. So my grandfather arranged transportation, food, and clothes, and found Mr. Leszkowicz a job and a place next door. The Russians liberated Piotrakov in March of 1945. The family moved to Lodz where every day my mother would go with her father to look at lists of survivors posted on lampposts. They never found anyone. My uncle George was born, the fourth Dubetsky child. They moved to Wroclaw near the German border, where they lived with the Savitskys, the Leszkowicz's cousins and fellow members of the underground. The war may have been over, but the challenges were not. On December 31st, 1945, Three Russian soldiers stopped my grandfather, claiming he had shot at them. They took his bicycle and most of his clothes. He stood nearly naked in the snow, as two soldiers fought over who would get to shoot him. The third let him go. <laughs> my grandfather filed a complaint with a Soviet official. He was so compelling, the commandant drove him home. Many months after the war had ended, the family finally told my mother she was Jewish. She was painting Easter eggs using brown onion skin and beets as dye. Her uncle Victor said they weren't going to go to church that day. He asked, have you ever seen a Jew? She said, no, but I don't like them. They wear all black, have black hats, and they frighten me. He said, not all Jews wear black. Not all Jews wear hats. Do you love your father? Do you love your mother? Of course, she replied. Well, they are Jewish. You are Jewish, and it is your destiny to be Jewish. Someday you will have your own table with your own customs and rituals. It took her a long time to accept that she was Jewish.
Although officials wanted to repatriate refugees, my grandfather wanted to go to France to look for his sister Lisa, who had moved to Paris before the war. They obtained new identity papers as German Jews. I went to a displaced persons camp in Geilinga, Germany. At first, the DP camp did not believe my family was Jewish. How could a family with four young children have survived? The DP camp, previously a nursing home, was a beautiful white building with shutters next to a big field of red poppies. My grandfather said to my mother, tomorrow you can run in the field as far as your little legs can carry you. For the first time, my mother felt safe and free. The Jewish agency offered to take the two older children to Palestine. My grandparents said, you are asking us to give you our children? Hitler couldn't separate us. You either take all of us or we stay. They stayed. My grandfather asked a young French seminary student volunteering at the DP camp to help them get to Paris. They took a train, but they didn't have permission to enter France, so they jumped out before the border. The seminary student took them the rest of the way. He had been an Ashkenazi Jew who converted to Catholicism. Years later, he became the Cardinal of Paris, Jean-Marie Lustiger. My family lived in Paris near Montmartre for six months. They learned that Lisa and her sons, Joseph 10 and Roger 3, had been deported to Drancy and Auschwitz. The family had two living relatives, my grandmother's brother Joseph in Palestine and my grandfather's younger sister Anne in the United States. But they couldn't get visas to either place. The first country that opened its doors was Australia. Sponsored by a Polish family and with help from Hyas and the Joint, they traveled for six weeks on Johann de Witt, an unstabilized cargo ship, arriving in Sydney in March of 1947. Lots of people were on the dock, my grandfather said. My children, there's no one calling out our names down there, and there's no one with outstretched arms for us but this is a glorious day. You can choose to wallow in the sadness of our past or embrace the new opportunity. It's your choice. My mother embraced her new life with ferocity. Passover took place one month later. My mother had her first Seder at the Melbourne Biala Stalker Center at a big white U-shaped table. The Australian hosts around the edge, the refugees in the middle. Melbourne was home to the largest per capita community of Holocaust survivors in the world after Israel. But the children didn't talk about their war years. My mother was acutely aware that she had no relatives. The Christian rituals of her childhood were not replaced by Jewish observance. My grandmother, with nearly all her family murdered, could no longer believe in God. My grandfather went to shul, and when they could afford it, they sent the children to Jewish day school. In 1964, my mother visited her uncle in Israel. On the way back in Athens, she met her beshert, Norman Cohn. Within days, he called his Polish-born mother in Waterloo, Iowa, and said, I've met the woman I'm going to marry. She's blonde, she's Australian, and she speaks Yiddish. <laughs> my mother married into the close Cohn family, eventually moving to Philadelphia and Florida. One by one, all my mother's siblings moved to America. My grandparents weren't going to be separated from their children, so they followed, reuniting with my grandfather's sister, Anne. I grew up with my grandmother's cooking and my grandfather's stories. I especially adored him. My mother kept her Australian citizenship for many years, just in case we would have to leave this country. My family stayed in touch with their extended Polish family. In the 1950s, the Leskovichs followed the Dubietskis to Australia and with my grandparents as sponsors. The Leskovichs and their cousins were recognized at Yad Vashem and the U.S. Holocaust Museum. In 1990, my family and the Leskovich family retraced their wartime journey in Belarus and Poland. Every time we met, my generation would ask, how did you decide to risk your lives? and the lives of your children to save a family you did not know. Their answer was always the same. We didn't think about it. We did what any decent human being would do. Once, they added, 
that it was my grandfather who saved them. Eight years ago, the last remaining member of that generation, Irka Leshkovich, passed away in Canada. My family attended the funeral where my mother spoke in Polish. My mother's childhood did not leave her bitter. She finds beauty and goodness everywhere. She's fiercely devoted to her family and the Jewish community and celebrates every opportunity with her five children and ten grandchildren often at a white Shabbat table or a large white U-shaped Seder table like the one at the Bielostocker Center. My parents taught us the importance of tzedakah, supporting Hayas and other Jewish organizations. My mother has been at BJ for every important event in our family's life, including when I named my first son Zachary Zevdov after my grandfather, and when Zachary and my younger son Benjamin dedicated their bar mitzvahs to Joseph and Roger, my mother's Parisian cousins who died in Auschwitz. I am thrilled that my mother and dad are here today. I would like to thank the rabbis for the, giving me the immense honor of sharing my family's story with the BJ community, our Jewish home for so many years. And I would like to express my deep gratitude to Miriam Abramovitz for her supportive guidance and stellar example of remembrance. To all here or watching virtually, let us all be inspired by the Leshkovich family and let decency spur action. And may each of you have many days at a big white table of your own, surrounded by your loved ones, joyfully celebrating our traditions and life. Ador v'ador, gamar hatimat tovah.